Hello and welcome back to The Stronghold. I'm the Magi and today we are going to be talking about Modern Horizons 3, most specifically about the set mechanically, the archetypes that it presents, as well as effectively collecting this particular set from an arena budget player's perspective. 2024 marks the 70th anniversary of the Godzilla franchise, and just like Godzilla, Modern Horizons 3 is going to be an absolute monster of a set. So if you want to throw your weight around just like Godzilla, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you find this video helpful, be sure to share it out on your favorite social media platform. Now, um, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, right. Now, before we really dig into the mechanical aspects of Modern Horizons 3, we have a little bit of an honorable mention for you because, of course, Wizards of the Coast never misses an opportunity to let us know just how socially conscious and forward-thinking they are attempting to be. And in such, they have renamed some pre-existing mechanics to avoid, uh, well, some cultural missteps. Uh, first off, there is no more totem armor. It is now referred to as Umbra armor. And if you don't know, this is a mechanic mostly found on auras. And uh, when the enchanted creature is destroyed, you instead destroy the aura and uh, leave the creature on the battlefield now less the aura. Uh, similarly, there is no longer tribal spells or permanents. Uh, instead, they have replaced this with the keyword kindred. Uh, nothing else has changed mechanically about it, and uh, no social concerns were damaged in the making of these changes. As we get started with today's discussion, I want to address one of the biggest uh, issues or concerns around Modern Horizons 3 in that a lot of people feel like it really isn't a set that was designed for Modern. Um, if we concede that most of the lower rarity cards, the commons and uncommons, were really designed with limited in mind, and then, although I haven't and won't pretend to have looked at every single rare and mythic, if we were to just assume that, let's say, half of those were actually designed more for commander players than for modern players, that means that only about 17% of this Modern Horizon set was actually designed with modern in mind. And, well, that's about one out of six cards from the total set. But I got news for you. As arena players, we really shouldn't care because modern as a competitive format doesn't actually exist on arena as of yet. So whether modern was the focus for this set or not really doesn't matter. The real issue is how can we as arena players and more specifically budget-minded arena players make use of these cards. And the biggest thing to understand here is that Modern Horizons 3 is not designed for legal or intended to impact what I often refer to as the rotational formats. It is not legal in Standard, Alchemy, or Standard Brawl. It is, of course, legal in most of Arena's Eternal formats, specifically Timeless, Historic, and Brawl. You should also make note that not all Eternal formats are going to be for Modern Horizons 3, specifically Explorer on Arena and Pioneer IRL Magic will not allow Modern Horizons 3 cards unless they were already legal in those formats. And well, frankly, specifically on Arena, those are going to be few and far between. So when it comes to Modern Horizons 3, Timeless and Brawl are your 100% best bets, and Historic is going to get you like 99% legality. 
Having just deleted a whole blurb about how we've been told to expect some preemptive bans but not told exactly what they were and how we probably wouldn't know about it until right before release day, well, lo and behold, they told us. So let's talk about it. Uh, most of these bans are occurring in Historic, uh, where they are concerned about the inherent power level of cards like Harbinger of the Seas, Winter Moon, the Elemental Evoke Cycle, the brand new Flare Cycle, and the new to Arena Enemy Fetch Lands. Uh, all of these are preemptively banned in Historic, but will be legal in Timeless as well as Brawl. For those that are not familiar with the Evoke Elemental Cycle, they are pictured here on the top row. Uh, all of these are extremely powerful, having an effect as they come into play. And if it did not come from the graveyard, it is uh, automatically um, sacrificed as a triggered effect. Uh, please note that there are no preemptive actions for Timeless, as previously discussed. So keep an eye on all of these Evoke Elementals. Uh, in particular, the Black Grief and Red Fury cards are very likely and threatening to take over the Timeless format. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind uh, as you're building decks. Uh, if you were to craft these and they got banned, of course you would get those wild cards back, but all the other stuff that you crafted to go with them, you wouldn't. For Brawl, it's a lot less discussion. They basically just preemptively banned Disruptor Flute uh, for its pithing needle-like effect that they just don't like to see in Brawl. Uh, really no surprise and no questions asked here. All right, so the next big thing to wrap your head around for Modern Horizons 3 and other potential future sets like this and many of you may have already picked up on this here through preview season, but the power level for Modern that this set is designed for is nearly exponentially higher than something like Standard. So a lot of times we're gonna be looking at these cards and thinking they are super powerful because 65 to 80% of the time when we're looking at new cards and evaluating them, we're doing so for Standard. But I would recommend being kind of hesitant on your craft button. Uh, hold off a little bit. Wait and see what these cards actually do in the environment. Because whether you're talking about modern or you're talking about timeless or even historic or brawl, uh, there is a much deeper card pool that these cards are interacting with. And while many of these cards would be phenomenal in something like standard or alchemy, they just may not have the impact in these broader formats like Modern. All right, so the last big hurdle here is, well, this set is kind of a keyword soup. Uh, in fact, according to Wizards themselves, there's over 40 keywords, abilities, actions, uh, mechanics, etc., etc. So there is a ton going on here. And unless you are an old school veteran that uh, really has never taken a break from magic since the beginning, which I'm not convinced such people actually exist, uh, you are probably or at least very likely to see something that uh, you either have never seen before or at the very least not seen in quite some time. Um, I do not plan to cover all of the keywords, mechanics, abilities, etc., etc., because, well, I have a life, and I presume you do too, and this video would be like 27 hours long or something insane. Uh, instead, I plan on focusing on those keywords and mechanics, etc., that are most likely to impact you, whether that is going to be at the pre release weekend or for your constructed or limited deck construction decisions. Now, first off, let's talk about a couple of general tips to help you navigate this uh, proverbial soup of mechanics. Uh, first and foremost, read your cards. I mean, I know it's kind of the impolite rule one. Reading the card explains the card, but the reality is Wizards has actually gotten pretty good about putting reminder text on cards. 
particularly those of lower rarities. So there's really no excuse to not know what's going on, particularly on your own cards. Don't go into round one of your pre-release event or whatever it is you might be doing with this set, drafting, etc., not knowing what your cards do. If you've read the card and you still don't get it, step two, don't turn to the guy next to you trying to build his deck too. He's got other things on his mind and he might not know anything either. Instead, whip out that handy dandy cellular device in your pocket and look it up. There's a lot of very knowledgeable websites out there, not the least of which is Gatherer, that you can look up a specific card and see exactly what the rulings on it are. Uh, similarly, if this still doesn't quite get it done for you, maybe it's uh, so new or so old that you can't find anything on it, partner with a judge. Just pull one aside. Generally, during that uh, registration and building period, particularly low-level judges are much less busy than they will be during round one. So go ahead and get your questions out of the way. Make sure you understand you're not bothering them. Judges love to explain mechanics and interactions and things like that. Oftentimes, they practically live for this. Um, once your rounds have started, if your opponent plays a card that you're not sure you understand, don't let them explain it to you. Don't take their word for it because, well, they might not know what they're talking about either, or in some cases, they might not have your best interest in heart. Instead, throw your hand up, yell for a judge, and ask your question from a definitive source. Again, they love this stuff and it's better to get it from an authority than, well, an opponent. All right then, so as we begin to start navigating all of these keywords and mechanics, believe it or not, the first thing we need to talk about for Modern Horizons 3 is actual mana. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that when they see a mana symbol that is essentially a number with a circle around it, that means they can pay that portion of mana cost with mana of any type. And similarly, I'm sure most people are very familiar with those five color mana symbols, the mountain, the island, the forest, etc., etc. Um, those are color specifics. Uh, you've got to have a mana of the specific color. What a lot of you maybe have not seen before, or at least not recently, is that gray mana symbol that is kind of a black diamond or a, a black hollow diamond. That is a mana that must be paid with a colorless mana, significantly different than the mana of any type. Uh, you have to have a source for colorless mana to pay that cost. Similarly, you're also gonna see hybrid cost where you have your choice of either of the two presented manas. Of course, waste are a basic land type that uh, exists already in your arena collection and you can add as many of those as you need to to your constructed decks. However, in limited, whether that is sealed for pre-release weekend, uh, a quick draft, a sealed event, whatever, you need to plan ahead for your colorless mana needs, whether that is drafting a snow-covered waste, uh, an artifact that helps you produce a amount of colorless mana, or a land that can tap to produce colorless mana. Uh, you need to make sure you are making limited decisions and you have the resources to support the cards you want to play. Because particularly at pre-release weekend, once you have registered your main deck, you don't necessarily get to change that from time to time. Uh, although, to be honest, it's been a while since I went to a pre-release and maybe they do let you change your main deck between rounds, but they didn't used to. There is also a fairly important comment here, Nightshade Dryad, a, a two mana, one, two uh, green common creature with death touch. 
it can tap for that all important colorless mana or a mana of any color. Um, I think this card is going to be bonkers in limited and might even give birth to its own uh, base green splash all the powerful cards uh, sort of archetype that we saw in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, at the very least, it's going to be important, if not groundbreaking. Uh, it was spoiled on last day, so it didn't get uh, its own cool slide the way most of the other things I'm talking about today did. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. And when trying to address those colorless mana needs, you should also be aware there are spawn creature tokens. Uh, these are zero one creatures that of course could uh, block for you. Um, they could even attack if you had some way of making it a productive attack. But most importantly, you can sacrifice these for a colorless mana. Uh, and in fact, there's 18 lower rarity cards that produce spawns or care about spawn tokens in some way. So this can be a very readily available source, particularly in those draft environments. And surprise, surprise, all this talk about colorless mana and sources and being prepared is all just a wind up to introduce our very first set of archetypes, which are built around Eldrazi, a classic, mostly colorless creature. Uh, in fact, I can't think of a single Eldrazi that is not colorless, either through its own color identity or the devoid mechanic, which means that a card or creature, spell, etc., is considered colorless regardless of its color mana identity. As you can see, Eldrazi represent two multicolor archetypes the green-blue as well as green-red. And while with 14 cards in green and 12 in blue and another 7 in colorless, the Simic archetype is certainly the deepest of the Eldraze options. But I would not be surprised at all if the only 6 red actually makes for either a very good splash opportunity in a dedicated Eldrazi slash colorless deck, or perhaps the Gruul archetype simply being more powerful. The number one reason for that being the Gruul Eldrazi also lean heavily on another group archetype that we'll talk about later in the video, that being modular. Modern Horizons 3 is widely regarded as a high synergy set, which is just a fancy way of saying that these cards are often designed to go together like peas and carrots. Cards like this most often break down into two categories. Uh, ones are enablers, the other side is payoffs. Um, one wants you to do certain things, the other one helps you do those certain things. And in some, rare and, uh, well, not rare in the uh, card rarity sense, uh, but the less frequent cases, a card will do both enable and pay off simultaneously. And these cards tend to be overpowered for their rarity. We very often see these in standout uh, signpost uncommons. Just like we saw with the Eldrazi, many of the draft or limited archetypes within this set tend to fit into uh, mechanical synergistic sub-themes like energy, which is a different kind of resource, kind of similar to mana that you're going to see on a lot of lower rarity cards. Uh, particularly in uh, the white, or excuse me, white blue color pair, blue red color pair, and red white color pairs, and really could create a very synergistic three color deck given the right circumstances. Uh, unlike mana that uh, floats until the end of a phase, energy just kind of hangs around in its own space until you use it for something and it's actually very difficult for your opponent to interact with. Uh, I can't think of a single way at this point. Uh, and sort of occupies the same space as poison counters as far as uh, its interaction within the game mechanics. As we start looking at the signposts for the energy archetypes, two things right off the bat. 
No, these cards are not actually formatted any different. I have just taken the liberty of cutting out the art in order to make them all fit on one slide. And yes, I decided to do that because there are both uncommon signposts as well as common signposts, not just for these three archetypes, but for all 10 two color archetypes in this set. And boy, let me tell you, most of these commons are pretty powered up. Uh, as for the overall signpost here in energy, as you can see, most of these pull double duty, both providing energy or helping you create energy, as well as giving you functional outlets to use that energy. And that makes this a very versatile archetype set here. Um, not only is this a tri-color that mixes and matches, making it very easy to build this deck, uh, both in constructed as well as in limited, uh, but they are all pretty good at it. Uh, energy, I think overall, is probably one of the archetypes for historic slash timeless where we are very likely to see an actual deck come together. My guess is it's probably going to be some sort of a combo S deck, but of course that remains to be seen as the brewers really haven't gotten hold of it just yet. Next up on our mechanical trifecta is the powerhouse of Modified, uh, taking up the green-white Selesnia, white-black Orzob, and green-black Golgari archetypes. And for those that don't know, Modified is kind of a shorthand uh, cluster grouping uh, for creatures which are equipped. Enchanted by an aura, its controller also controls or have counters of any type uh, including, of course, plus one, plus one counters. These, of course, are in addition to the incidental modify sub-themes that we have seen within the previously discussed Eldrazi and Energy archetypes. Let's take a look at, at each of these modified two-color pairs, and technically, red-black does fit this category, as it makes very good use of equipments, but in the broader strokes, this is really an artifacts matter or affinity archetype, making it a little bit of a standout. Uh, Cranial Ramp here is its uh, signpost common, and as you can see, it's an extremely powerful equipment, and um, probably the common that Gavin has talked about uh, needing to be banned in Popper, although the Popper committee has not taken any action at the time of recording. Green Black Golgari makes good use primarily of the adapt mechanic to help you put and reward you for putting plus one plus one counters on your creatures, making them modified. The white black archetype uh, from Orzob more broadly just likes counters in general, uh, making use of multiple kinds, uh, not the least of which is plus one plus one. But as you can see from the gargoyle signpost common, uh, persist counters still come back around. And the nice thing about that is uh, if you have a minus one minus one counter and a plus one plus one counter on it, both of them go away. So you can make the uh, obstinate gargoyle really live up to its name uh, by making it come back over and over and over again by getting rid of that uh, minus one, minus one counter when it persists and, and just keep coming back for more. Uh, you'll also notice the inherent card advantage built into Not Master by having a sorcery that creates plus one, plus one counters for your creatures, as well as a core rogue 2-2 two, two for four mana uh, creature that, of course, um, gets plus one, plus one counters on it whenever a modified creature you have dies. And of course, the green-white Selesnya deck maybe is the most uh, broad-minded modified archetype out there. Uh, not only does it uh, use and love plus one, plus one counters, but helps you enable auras and equipment as well. Um, generally, this is the archetype that fits very nicely uh, not only with the starter decks for the last couple of years, but as well as the Selesnya Enchantress deck that has been 
well, kind of running rampant in standard for the last two to three years. So if you're looking for a fairly easy on-ramp to uh, get into historic or timeless, combining some of this archetype with your existing standard pool should be a pretty easy going option. And if that wasn't enough to entice you towards Selesnia, Wizards of the Coast has been kind enough to give us no less than seven bestow creatures at lower rarities in this set. Now, if you don't know, bestow is an activated ability on the card that allows you to cast it for an often modified cost as an aura on a creature you already have on the battlefield, or in some cases, maybe a creature that isn't yours. Uh, the nice thing about this is auras typically open you up to being two for one because when they kill the creature, they also kill the aura. Not so here with these bestow creatures because when the bestowed creature is destroyed, instead the aura falls off onto the battlefield and becomes a creature in its own right, uh, often retaining the nice attributes of the aura that it was granting to the other creature. Uh, this not only eliminates that two-for-one threat, but creates a pseudo-card advantage here, uh, allowing each of these cards to have a potential double life. If you've been paying attention, you will no doubt have noticed that in just three broad mechanical categories here, we have managed to cover nine of the ten archetypes, leaving really only Demir out there. And this is less of a mechanic and more just a concept uh, built around card advantage. They want you to draw cards. And that's great and all, but don't forget, drawing cards does not answer your opponent's threats and does not actually provide you with a win con 99.9% .9 of the time. It just helps you find those cards within your deck. So don't forget, don't get too focused on just drawing cards as enablers and payoffs. Make sure you include some win cons and some threat elimination as well. Now that we have discussed the limited archetypes for this set, and the major mechanical attributes of the set, there is one last thing I need to talk about to get you ready for your pre-release, and that is make sure to bring your wallet. Uh, we have all recently had to adapt to the price increases uh, inherent in the moving from draft boosters to play boosters. And well, Modern Horizons 3 is threatening to become the largest and best-selling set in the history of Magic the Gathering. And believe it or not, we are seeing its play boosters going for $10 a pop in the US market. Uh, that means that for me locally, most of my event sponsors, uh, event organizers are doing pre-release at a $65 US entry fee. And well, that's about double what it was less than a year ago. Um, you could easily go to a pre-release not that long ago for $25 or $30. Uh, so prices have definitely gone up. Not to say this isn't worth it, not to say that people should stay home. Uh, but do be aware uh, when you go in that this is going to cost a little more than what you're used to. As we begin to look at Modern Horizons 3 from the perspective of a budget player trying to build a collection on Arena, the first broad stroke category to be aware of is the modal double-faced land cards. Um, for instance, there are two in each of the five primary colors. Uh, one of these is most often a creature, and of course the other is most often not a creature. With regards to the creatures, these are all pretty decent, but in many cases a little overcosted. Uh, as is the case with a lot of double face cards. Uh, the creatures also tend to come with a nice ETB style trigger to give you the opportunity to potentially affect the board state as it comes into play. Um, the non creature cards, of course, tend to be very robust and commonplace effects 
uh, like bounce spells and things of that nature. And on the back of all of these is the corresponding mono land, mono color land, which generally will come into play tapped unless you pay three life. Again, there is two for each color, so we're talking about a total of 10 monocolor modal land cards. In a very similar vein, there is a full 10 series set here of hybrid spell slash modular cards, or excuse me, modal cards, representing all of the ally and enemy color pairs. Um, these can be creatures or effects, but the back side of the card is always a dual land that comes into play tapped. All 20 of these cards that we've talked about are available at Uncommon. And really, these are things that, as budget players, we are going to want to make sure we have in our collection because of the utility and value that they represent for us as deck builders, both in constructed and limited play. Uh, some of the actual creatures or spell effects are very strong, and you are going to want to count those as spells in your deck construction process. Others of them are kind of iffy or uh, very circumstantial, in which case uh, you might count them as either a spell or a land. And then, uh, for instance, Waterlogged Teachings here is, well, a pretty bad and limited tutor. So you are almost always playing that for the land value, and you want to make sure that you count that as such. All of these are particularly powerful for us as budget players because of what we refer to as an opportunity cost. As consumers within the economy, we often fixate on the monetary cost of whatever. Um, in the case of opportunity though, what it is actually costing you is all of the other options that you could have taken. Um, to put it another way, it's not so much that your favorite candy bar costs $2. Um, in terms of opportunity, what it really costs you is the opportunity to have tried all of the other candy bars that that $2 could have allowed you to purchase. When it comes to deck building, very often we face opportunity cost in trying to get the land ratios right within our deck because for every land that we put in our deck, that means one less spell or creature that we get to put in. The beautiful thing about these modal double-faced land cards is they have a much lower opportunity cost, providing a land when you need it, as well as a non-land when the opportunity arises. And hey, if 20 uncommon lands isn't enough for you, don't worry, there's more. And in fact, there's a lot more that we haven't talked about yet. There's a cycle of 10 common lands that help you fix your mana or cycle built around the 10 three color combinations. There's five more uncommon lands that we didn't even touch on. There's the five allied fetch lands at rare that are available in this set that were also recently available in Kanza Tarkir. There is a five monocolor rare utility land cycle. There's uh, the deserted temple at rare, and there's two mythic lands. In total, 48 different named lands within this set, meaning that almost 20% of this set is land. Yeah, you heard that right. Almost one out of five cards is going to be land. When it comes to uncommons in this set, there are a few standouts. Uh, Worn Power Stone is one of the few low rarity reprints on Arena, particularly given the fact that so much of Modern Horizons 3 does represent some level of reprint. Most of it is new to Arena. Um, also, Solar Transformer and Vexing Bobble are both uncommons that are going to see a lot of play, particularly for us budget players. 
uh, Solar Transformer, I think, is one of those particular brawl staples moving forward for us uh, looking to do it on a budget. Having that level of uh, flexible fixing at an uncommon is just really a standout. And of course, Vexing Bobble in competitive sideboards is going to be around for a long time to come. Uh, whether that is going to be in Timeless or Historic, uh, plan on seeing a lot of this card. Now, I said it before, this set has a lot of powerful looking cards. And when it comes to particularly rares and mythics, what's going to be right for you is hard for me to advise. Uh, because really, it's going to come down to how you like to interface with the, the game itself, particularly on Arena. Uh, for instance, the fetch lands are staples, but if you don't play Brawl or Timeless, they're kind of dead cards to you in Historic. Um, overall, tons of these are going to look extremely powerful, and the best advice I can give is to have more of a wait and see attitude. Let the cards prove themselves in your format of choice before rushing out and crafting them because it would be very easy to think that a card is going to be very powerful and have a big impact, and then it just doesn't. That, of course, brings us right into budgeting for Modern Horizons 3. And, of course, at the beginning of the year, we were very much given the impression that this was going to be a fully supported set, and we made budget decisions based on that perspective. Uh, at this point in time, we don't see any reason to believe that Jump In is going to exist for Modern Horizons 3. Uh, similarly, we are probably only going to see one discounted pack on such a short season. Uh, and again, depending upon how you interact with Arena, this may be a set that you're very interested in or potentially not at all. So don't be surprised if you have somewhere between 10,000 and maybe as much as 75,000 unspent gold this season. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do with that. Of course, you may want to draft more or buy more packs of Modern Horizons 3 or cut that down to nearly nothing. And of course, if standard or rotational formats are more of your thing, don't be hesitant to carry some or all of this balance forward into Bloomborough, which, believe it or not, is going to be releasing at the end of July, just 50 days or so within the Modern Horizons 3 season. As we wrap things up here, don't forget this is generally the biggest and most time-consuming video that I do each season. So do us a favor, smash that like button, let me know that this is something that helps you out. And if it does in fact help you out, consider sharing it out to your favorite social media platform so that it can help even more people within our budget community. And before we go, I want to take just a moment to thank my totally awesome patrons for supporting me and allowing me to apply my passion into a community. And of course, before we go, I've got some suggestions for your next step. I've got some suggestions for your next step.